Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all had a good lunch, and uh, we thank the local organizing committee for that. It was an elaborate spread in need. Back to science. We'd like to start this uh, session on macular diseases. I'm uh, Dr. Madan. I'm, I'll be your moderator. At the outset, I'd uh, call the wise counsel on stage, please. Dr. Charu Gupta, Dr. Anand Rajendran, sir, Dr. Rupak Roy, Dr. Avinash Patange, and Dr. Vasumativi. As has been the norm this uh, meeting, I'd like to have more of discussion, so I request uh, our speakers to stick to their time. And uh, audience, please free, feel free to send your questions in. And uh, without wasting time, we'll go ahead. First keynote talk, managing MACTEL with and without CNVM, Dr. Romano Andre. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor. Love India. I love the Indian food. Very good. Like curry, the spicy. So, um, as we know, MacTau is a rare uh, acquired macular disease that leads to progressive vision weakening. The pathophysiology is believed to be neurodegenerative, characterized, characterized by a primary loss of Miller cells and secondary to a reactive vascular changes. Selective ablation of Miller cells leads to photoreceptor apoptosis in outer retinal view vascularization. So we have some of the MACTAL findings, especially we're talking, focusing on MACTAL type two. So we have all of these information loss, macular pigmentation, interretinal cavitatic, capillary ectasia, uh, crystalline deposits, and so on. Uh, a few years ago, Emily Chu and, and all uh, proposed a classification similar, um, uh, um, classification system that delineates uh, MACTAL in, in seven stages that uh, includes presence and location of ellipsoid zone, the same thing for macular pigmentary deposits, uh, hyperreflective foci, and subretinal neovascularization. Here's an example of a patient with MACTEL type 2. Really difficult to uh, go into details, the color fundus photography. You can appreciate the fluorescent geography. We, can, we, of course, if we zoom in, we have a little bit of more details of an abnormal hyperfluorescence uh, and leakage from the temporal juicifovio capillary plexus. But uh, as, I, as we talked before, uh, it's, it's only the superficial plexus. It, it's also important that early on in the disease, telangiectasia is closely related to IZ disruption. And this leads to a subclinical photoreceptor changes. As you can see in here, there is uh, photoreceptor changes and maybe loss. As, as, it advances, as it advances, there is an easy disruption and more prominently associated with the disease. There's, there's a term that we like to call, it's a photoreceptor at risk, because it's along the margins of the easy and before the development of uh, structural abnormalities. And also, it's an initial source for signaling of overlying vasculature. Here, you can see a little bit better the details. Uh, you can see the cavities in there. You can see the... Uh, photoreceptor loss, uh, the easy, and so on. Vascular manifestation of MACTAL should, should be observed throughout OCTA. OCTA has been superior to fluorescent angiography and visualize, especially the deep capillary plexus where we'll, we'll talk about it. As you can see here, um, there is from superficial all the way to the deep. The deep capillary plexus is a particular interest in MACTAL as it harbors the mass, a majority of vascular changes and is purely perfused, as you can see it in there, in the lower parafovio vascular density, and may show the evidence of MACTEL before the superficial capillary plexus. Here is a better example of we'll zoom in. As you can see in outline in red, you can see the, um, what's, uh, the, 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 the changes, the vascular changes in the deep capillary plexus, uh, very well out outlined in there. So that in, as, as the disease advances, as you, as you can see here on the disease stage on the CTA, uh, it, once, you once you have the photoreceptor at risk, it suggests that uh, it may go into a progressive disruption of the vascular barriers. So um, in these cases, you can uh, be very careful um, as you can, the, the, probably the most uh, 
an interesting area to evaluate is the vascular retinal flow. Be very uh, cautious in this area. Here's another case uh, where we use a projection resolved OCTA where you can isolate the, the, uh, the membrane and we can really appreciate the, the details. Also, we, uh, with the new um, softwares that we are coming in right now, we can also um, use the same thing, the same, the same projection resolved OCT, and, and, uh, but in a three-dimensional way, then you can see the, uh, the, the details much better. Regarding um, the promising therapies in the future, uh, some of the novel therapies of MACTEL target um, Miller cell dysfunction through the ciliary neurotrophic factor. It's a, it's a surgical implantation of slow release intravitreal uh, CNTV that has shown promise to slow retinal degeneration in subjects in, in MACTEL. Also, we have been using, we have a few cases that we're trying to use uh, um, um, endpoint management laser uh, in, in some cases uh, of patients with MACTEL and follow these cases. We're gathering, uh, we have eight patients so far, and it's, it seems to be a very interesting possibility. Um, endpoint management, for those that are not familiar with, is a, sim, a, a, a very subtle laser, similar to Micropose, a little bit more sophisticated, well-driven, more predictive, predictable, and it seems to be very interesting this case. So uh, in conclusion, uh, ISV disruption and subclinical photoreceptor change should be monitored closely in patients with uh, MACTEL. Photoreceptor loss and vascular abnormalities become complete with the appearance of new vascularization. It seems that neurotrophic factor therapy and laser uh, and endpoint management laser appears to be a, a promising option for MACTEL. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Uh, Start the discussion. Before that, if we could have uh, the next speaker getting ready, please. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to ask Dr. Omar, do we have any uh, systemic associations uh, with relation to MACTEL? Is there any proved association with systemic diseases like diabetes, hypertension? Uh, if we could manage that, could the disease process MACTEL change? I mean, uh, it's really uh, difficult to, uh, you, you mean, uh, mean uh, systemic hypertension? Well, I, I'm not aware of um, clinical data that, that proves that, that closely. And I, I, don't, I don't know if that would change the, the, my, my treatment. Right. Talk, Dr. Romano, I just wanted to know, you mentioned uh, you used micropulse uh, with NPOWN. Is it for a specific subset of patients? And how would it perform? Have you tried it out in patients with MACTEL with just, uh, uh, serous subretinal fluid? So, uh, Out CNV. Yeah. So some of the patients, the patients that don't have neovascularization, that's the one that we're trying to use. So some of these patients, they have nothing to do it. So what we do it, we try to uh, target, we do a microperimetry before the treatment, and we target the surrounding areas. We don't focus on, on the area of the lesion. We try to stimulate the RP uh, to work. it, And it, apparently it, it, it works. It, uh, uh, a few patients, and now we're collecting more to see the outcome. But one thing is that it takes time. It takes about two, uh, three to six months to start seeing the, the, the results. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Avinash, if I may, we do see a lot of lamella macular holes and an occasional full thickness hole. So would we be looking at it differently uh, compared to a pseudo, I mean, uh, idiopathic hole, or uh, we to operate a little early, does it make a difference in uh, MACTL patients? So in terms of full thickness holes, also because we are all re having a compromised vessel, functionally, structurally, get abnormal. I would say if you're doing a full thickness, then things can get different, but uh, we don't have enough cases to say uh, that it will follow a path from A to B. Been very anecdotal with cases, but generally it's a, it's a point in terms of uh, a discussion which you should have with patients. Uh, I would not resonate much with the lamellar part of it, more so with full thickness holes. I have a question for you in terms of uh, when you had this uh, discussion about photoreceptors, which gets abnormal, and then vascular remodeling, vascular 
vascular or new vascularization. So how do you see it happening? Actually? What triggers the photoreceptor loss? Its association with modeling and new vascularization. So, um, so the the photoreceptor loss um, occurs actually. I believe it occurs when the Miller cells are being um, damaged. But the the very first thing that you have. Uh, what we found out is that the photoreceptors are a predictor of, of disease progression and also new vascularization. So when it happens, what we're trying to do is that not only OC, using OCT, but OCTA, but uh, we're also using, we're, we're helping to, uh, we developed along with a company that, um, that came from out of from Bascom Palmer called Virtu Virtual Vision. It has a virtual, virtual reality headset and we're doing a microperimetry like prototype sy system that we're actually following this patient. Um, I actually can show some of the data here. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, moving to uh, CNVM, actually with CNVM, would you advocate from long-term studies that you've done? Uh, ERN-based therapy or a treat and extend? Next oh, treat I, I think, I think. Two. Thoughts there? I think it's completely different uh, type of treatment. I think you have to monitor month by month. Uh, I mean, I, we shouldn't. Oh, I, I know the the late pathophysiology is similar. Not at the beginning of this, but late the, the induction of the neovascularization. However, the the way they behave is different. Sometimes you you inject once, it doesn't work. You have to inject more. But I in my in my clinic, I I come to ask these patients to come every month once they develop uh, neovascularization. When based on more treat and extend, or depending on the, the new vascularization data. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Romano. Uh, what is the rationale of use of endpoint laser, considering that the primary pathology is Muller cell? Yeah. Well, um, it, it started uh, with a study done by uh, Daniel Lovinsky and, and Daniel Palanker from Stanford. It proved that it, it could work based on the stimulus of the RP rounding IRP, so they, they proved, they, they published uh, uh, two or three cases that they show that the RP, simulating the RP, um, it, it might work. I, I don't know the details of that, but we're, we're, we're looking into that, as I mentioned, actually not only lo looking at the OCT, OCTA on FOSS and so on, and also fluorescein, but also we're trying to assess this patient with the functional information, such as microperimetry and this VR, um, we're using both the Maya system and also this uh, VR um, virtual reality with artificial intelligence um, device. Just one question. Proliferative. Any kind of treatment for these patients, especially the patients if you have some sort of attachment without any clear membrane. No, well, that, that's what I mentioned. I. Some of these cases are we are actually doing the the endpoint management. We, we don't have a lot of MacTel patients there, but trying to collect as many as it, and this this kind of study has to be a long term study, at least two years to see if it's advantage it's advantageous or not. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, healthy discussion. So now we'll move on to the next talk. PRM tractional was degenerative, Dr. Jayesh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Team VRSI, for inviting me to give a talk on ERM tractional versus the retinal uh, tractional versus the degenerative form. So, over the last couple of decades, transforming from a slit lamp biomicroscopic evaluation of our patients to the OCT technology has dramatically improved our ability to visualize the foveal microanatomy. And using this technology, more and more uh, evaluation of macular pathologies, specifically those linked to intramacular interface abnormalities, have revealed uh, some amount of irregular foveal contours in these patients. And as our observations is becoming more refined, new phenotypes have been identified. So this was one of the landmark papers that was published by Govet et al. in 2016. And the authors described two forms of VMI based on the structural OCT and they categorize them as either tractional form or degenerative form. So different pathological mechanisms were proposed for each of these entities and ERMs that are associated with both these phenotypes were also identified. 
to a typical epiretinal membrane were associated with a tractional mechanism, whereas an epiretinal proliferation was associated with a degenerative form. So an ERM is actually the proliferation of fibrocellular tissue onto the surface of the retina along the ILM and on OCT it appears as an uh, irregular white hyperreflective line over the ILM with an uh, irregular underlying retina and presence of multiple hyperreflective spaces that is present between these two layers. As against this, uh, epiretinal proliferation appears as a thick homogeneous isoreflective material over the ILM and which is completely in contact with the ILM with absence of any hyperreflective spaces which helps us to differentiate it from the uh, typical ERMs. And this isoreflective epiretinal proliferation as seen on the OCT is also covered by another thin hyperreflective line. So if you look morphologically, the degenerative form usually has a top hat appearance with rounded edges and intraretinal cavitations. Along with that, there is involvement of the other retinal layers in the form, in the form of ellipsoid layer uh, defects, a central retinal bump, as well as presence of these epiretinal proliferation. As compared to this, the tractional form usually has a moustache kind of an appearance with sh sharp sciatic edges and presence of intraretinal splitting with an intoid uh, ellipsoid zone. The tractional ERM is present with intraretinoid cystoids also. Now when we come to the natural history, the tractional form usually starts with the induction of a posterior vitreous detachment and there is usually a progressive vitromacular traction that is seen in these patients. So if this traction keeps on persisting, in some patients there may be a complete foveal detachment which can lead to a full thickness macular hole formation. However, when this process aborts, there may be a partial detachment, that is a detachment of the inner foveal wall cyst and that gives rise to the lambular macular hole formation. Now when this traction is happening, it leads to molar cell cone disruptions that causes the splitting at the level of the OPL and the ONL. And in the end stage, it gives a characteristic moustache kind of appearance in these eyes. vis when we compare the degenerative form, the presence of epiretinal proliferation and easy uh, defect is noticeable from the earliest stage itself. And it is a slow gradual degeneration that involves all the retinal layers. And initially there may be a presence of mild foveal bump that can be in the uh, top second image. And this foveal bump also gradually evolves and progresses over a period. And at the end, it gives a characteristic top hat kind of appearance. Now, none of our, uh, you know, uh, learning into the pathogenesis of any of the vitroretinal disease, it's very important to look at the choroid. So there are few studies that have compared the features of choroid between uh, these two forms of uh, vitromacular interface abnormalities. And this one important study by Kim et al. They have shown a greater subfoveal choroidal thickness at baseline was correlated to anatomical progression in the tractional form which was not the case with the degenerative form in their study. And they proposed that an anterior posterior traction itself caused a mechanical increase in the choroidal thickness in all these patients. And at the same time, it also caused an RP stretching, which leads to an elevated wedge of release from these eyes. And that causes hyperpermeability of the choroidal vessels and subsequently a choroidal thickening. Now, there are few other studies that have shown a uh, reduced choroid thickness in patients who have a degenerative form of uh, these vitromacular interface abnormalities. So this, uh, and they have proposed that a reduction in the choroidal thickness itself causes a ischemic degeneration of the outer retinal layers that gives to the characteristic top hat appearance in these eyes. Even OCTA evaluation have been done in these eyes and it has been shown that eyes who have the tractional form, they have a smaller FAZ size and a, higher, and a higher foveal vascular density is both in the superficial as well as deep capillary plexus. And uh, when it was compared to the degenerative forms of LMH, and the degenerative form itself had a lower paravascular foveal density also. So this shows that all these patients of uh, uh, degenerative form, they have a lower choroidal thickness as well as the FAs, uh, as well as the vascular density of the retina is also low. So all these points more towards a degenerative form uh, in which the degeneration involves all the retinal layers as well as the choroid. Then uh, there is a sing, uh, single systemic review and meta-analysis that has looked into the management aspects of both these kinds of disease entities. And this has shown that primary vitrectomy for both these forms led to the, an equal amount of visual acuity improvement. So this is important because we are usually reluctant in operating patients with degenerative ER ERMs, but this uh, review has shown that the visual outcomes may be 
equivocal and at the same time a higher incidence of full thickness macular hole was seen in eyes that was associated with the degenerative form. So this is one uh, complication or a post operative thing that we should take into account while uh, advising surgeries for these patients. And at the same time there are few other studies that have shown that the visual acuity outcomes of vitrectomy in eyes who have a degenerative form of ERMs may not be on par with those with tractional elements. And uh, even a recent Cochrane review has uh, could only assess a single paper uh, which was a randomized prospective study comparing both these entities. So it definitely underscores the lack of evidence towards surgical intervention comparing these two eyes. So just to summarize the advent of OCT allows a clear differentiation between both these forms of disease entities. And although a fibrocellular proliferation remains the underlying nature, but more research needs to be done with the uh, evaluating the role of choroid and in and also the retinal vasculature to better understand the pathophysiology of this condition and at the same time prospective randomized studies are warranted to formulate a, a better management guidelines and till that time eyes who have a documented progressive loss of vision or a morphological deterioration are the ideal candidates for surgery thank you and uh, just a few points for discussion maybe so maybe we can discuss into the pathogenesis whether is there actually a vascular component or there is just a degenerative form that takes care in these things and if you look into the management what are the indications for surgery so is the visual acuity of the patient only criteria for advising the surgery or do we actually look into the degenerative or traction nature also or we just look into the stages of ERM and what is the role of ILM paling in all these patients because since we have seen uh, that patients who have degenerative form, they have a higher risk of development of full thickness macular hole post-operatively. So is there a role for ILM peeling in all the degenerative forms or should we consider even in the traction elements? Thank you. Ask Dr. Charu ma'am to, uh, this is the first point that he was making. Is that degenerative or is there a... Seems like more like a degenerative vascular component to them. And uh, I think, yeah, in most situations, I think uh, unless, yeah, Besides visual acuity, I think even just looking at the OCT features. So I think most of the time we, f we see that the outer retinal layers stay okay. As long as the outer retinal layers are okay, I don't think we should be intervening, especially in the degenerative, in the, yeah, in the tractional patient. Again, they are besides uh, visual acuity, even the symptom at uh, whether the patient is complaining of metamorphopsia or not, that again becomes an important uh, decision. So do you have a visual acuity uh, cutoff where you would advise us for either a decent way to form or a, this? So usually I would say 6 by 12 okay. or uh, less, but uh, if the patient is symptomatic and there's a progressive, uh, uh, I mean the, the OCT has progressively worsened, then maybe even at a slightly better vision we can, in, not okay. in the degenerative attraction, attraction, because the degenerative it's very difficult. I think just to answer that, I think uh, the key thing here is uh, not just absolute vision, but uh, documented in the drop in vision when the patient experiences and and buys into your you know really do wholeheartedly say about uh, there's another component which come into play HEP lamellar hole associated retinal proliferation there again the debate is as much uh, there and the, again this drop in vision absolute vision may also be because of the degeneration such. So, uh, you know, when you promote uh, degeneration and you see that with corresponding on the OCT. To add on to that, as Dr. Anand and Dr. Charu have mentioned, documented progression, especially OCT based documentation of progression of the epiretinal membrane is warrant surgery even if the patient has 6 6 vision. And I normally don't peel the ILM through the hole. I leave a cuff of ILM around the hole to prevent a future full thickness macular hole. While we are at it, when we are, while we are discussing surgery, is there an absolute red flag where we say, no, here we do not do surgery? Important thing in this ERM surgeries are quality of the vision that the patient has. What improvement can we offer to the patient? The patient has a vision of 6, 9 and 6, 12. The patient is happy with that. Sometimes even after good ERM surgeries, we can see retinal vision. Retinal vision can go down to 6. And we are very unhappy. First point is patient has to be symptomatic. Really good. I'm not sure your final thought. No, I'll take a points which 
put it in the management of the program is first is uh, manage the expectations of the patient, second is the skill, third is the competence. So there is no question about skill because it's not very intensive skill bound surgery in terms of healing the ERMs. Uh, the first is managing competence, it's very individualistic, the conversation where you have with the patient. And I think the crux of the third is the it comes to competence. And I would really attest the summary and two of these, your points in the summary, I said, you have to understand it further. Okay. So yeah. I would not be in a state where I would like to operate the scan of the patient alone, indication, such kind of Yes, probably that's the take home message. We don't operate the scan, we operate the patient, and it's important to understand what the patient actually needs, the document progression before we actually take up the patient for surgery. Thank you all. Now I'd like to uh, call the next speaker, new and rare, epiretinal neovascularization and PVAC, Dr. Apurva H. Talking about epiretinal neovascularization, macular telangiectasia type 2. And next, after that, I'll be speaking on peripheral exudative vascular anomalous complex. Not that they're related, they're just probably because they are novel. So I'll dive straight into my cases. The first case that I, we ever saw of uh, an epiretinal neovascularization, from here on I'll be uh, referring to it slides as... Slides are not ERM. moving, slides are not moving, and the AVT. So the first case was a 48-year-old woman with uh, diminished vision for near, a diabetic for 3 years, 6, 9 and N8 vision. He had features typical of MACTEL with this uh, pigment here at the temporal paraphobia. This was the right eye OCT and the left eye OCT. We can see that there is a pigmentation that's very, very superficial in the right eye. The left eye pigmentation is still intraretinal. When we did an OCTA, uh, this was typical of a deep vascular plexus uh, abnormal MACTEL capillaries, but this was a surprising finding that we saw on the surface of the retina, and there was a projection artifact of that on the superficial vascular complex. This was the right eye FFA, there was a, a exuberant leak, temporal paraphobial and there was some typical MACTEL leak in the nasal uh, paraphobia and there were DR changes, the mid peripheral and peripheral fundus. This is the left eye MACTEL leakage, temporal paraphobia. Just when we were uh, ignoring this case as some one-off thing, we saw another case and this time the patient had no associate, associated diabetic retinopathy. So was a 61 year old gentleman, again uh, typical MACTEL pigment but what was interesting was this uh, membrane on top of the ILM and there was an association with a lot of pigment intraretinally and in the superficial retina. Left eye had uh, typical MACTEL OCT changes with the collapse and degenerated. This was the OCTA, uh, when we segmented it uh, we uh, saw that at the vitroretinal interface there was this ear cut membrane, the projection artifact of which was seen in the superficial retina and this is the abnormal capillaries uh, typical of MACTEL in the deeper layers. So now uh, we got tuned to seeing this more, uh, we found a couple of more cases, there was this uh, very thin membrane in another case, luckily we had a tag that was coming up so when I segmented that it was having a flow signal and there was a bright hyperreflective uh, spot on the octa and this is case 4, this is hardly anything but we did find something on the OCTA corresponding to that very flimsy member, the OCT. So I call this epiretinal neovascularization and uh, we published it a few years ago, it's really not novel anymore, more and more people have found it. Um, so possible hypothesis for this could be that the retina is so thin like you can see in the first ever case that we saw it's probably bearing of the superficial capillaries the abnormal capillaries of MACTEL maybe the pigment is physically pushing the superficial complex capillaries to the surface it possibly is just because I called it a neovascularization it really could be that also because just like we have a subretinal neovascularization or retinochoroidal anastomosis that is happening in abnormal capillaries in MACTEL, this could be a similar endpoint uh, like the other two. One of some of the salient findings which were associated with ERN was that it 
was associated with pigment in all seven eyes. There were no degenerative spaces, lamellar holes or drapes and there was no neovascularization. One thing that does come to mind is uh, whether considering that MACTEL is associated with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy uh, in up to I think 10% eyes, uh, one possibility is having a foveal neovascularization in cases of diabetic retinopathy. Possibly does this foveal neovascular membrane upstage the uh, age of PR? Should we start calling this PDR because there is moderate NPDR changes in the background and there is just this foveal neovascularization at the, yeah. But there are MACTIL changes also. It's a little confusing, so uh, I made this table just to kind of make uh, some differences between the two, FNV, foveal neovascularization, uh, will have other PDR changes. Uh, this is a picture shared by my friend uh, Dr. Jay Shet, uh, where there was a foveal neovascularization in a case of generative spaces uh, with a clear cut MACTIL appearance. And this responded very well to anti VEGF. There is not this extreme thinning uh, compared to uh, MACTIL. And it is a closed loop network like it would be for any neovascularization. PRN, on the other hand, uh, all my cases had no diabetic renopathy, obviously. Um, even if it was there, it were lower grades and not PDR changes. There were pigment plaques and interretinal migration of the pigment in all the cases. I do not know what happens to these membranes after anti VEGF. There is severe thinning compared to the. Uh, moderate thinning that we had in the other subset and it mo it was not completely closed loop. So again uh, Jay injected anti vegf in this case of foveal neovascularization that showed a very brisk response. So you can see that response here. So this is another case uh, where um, uh, this is again by my friend Dr. Sumit Singh. This was a case of MACTEL uh, which had a bleed subretinally uh, and intraretinally in the left eye. This was the FFA of the right eye which shows the circumferential MACTEL leakage. And this is the OCT with uh, intraretinal pigment migration and thinning. This was the left eye which uh, had block fluorescence because of the bleed and the circumferential leakage uh, otherwise. So here uh, when you see the top there is a nice membrane and deduce that this is probably an epiretinal neovascularization that bled. That, that brings me back to the point that possibly this is also an endpoint neovascularization just like RAP and uh, SRNV. So this was another case that uh, we saw recently. Um, I, I spoke about epiretinal. This is just below the ILM sub ILM, a very pretty lacy network that we found, sub ILM. So uh, I called it SILM and NV, sorry. So yeah, next is uh, PVAC. Uh, Kirkies was the first to describe it, 2011. Uh, it's uh, generally an isolated large aneurysm. It is classically referred to as a PVAC only if it is uh, intraretinal unilateral hyperreflective lesion with cystic spaces and no neovascularization. There should be no associated ocular or systemic disease. This was a PVAC-like ectasia which uh, we published in Osley Retina a couple of years ago. We called it PVAC-like because it was unilateral, round, hyperreflective and hyperfluorescent uh, but there were arterial loops as well. So, uh, this was the evac lesion that we saw on the OCT and OCTA and there was this intense flow signal on the OCTA and it responded rather well to laser therapy. You can see the resolution on the octa. So considering that we are seeing these larger aneurysms rather ubiquitously in many retinal vascular diseases and uh, considering they are far commoner than reported, um, it's Probably uh, not a good idea to term it a PVAC, but rather retinal capillary macroaneurysms like Dr. Spade has. All of these lesions uh, have hyporeflective uh, a core and a hyperreflective wall with poor response to anti-VEGF and a better response with steroid or laser. 
so uh, considering that there are many names for the same thing like evax and tel caps and macro mini aneurysms retinal capillary macro aneurysms i think our vote is for retinal capillary macro aneurysm because it's the least ambiguous thank you thank you uh, dr apurva as you mentioned uh, not so novel anymore but definitely our knowledge about the whole spectrum is still evolving and uh, we probably have some distance to go i'd like to open the discussion uh, by asking anand sir this spectrum how do we do we have actual pointers to say this is probably diabetic related this is probably macular related or this is probably an do we have any specific pointers I don't think we have definitive markers uh, no there's a different associated macular macular is not part of the diabetic retinopathy association so that way there are no definitive uh, markers there the thing is about uh, it's a common term this one you know as uh, more people have reported this what is the incidence of scarring oh, superficially subilem area we have a new vascular network there think forwards uh, does this more often or how does it uh, translate you know that pigments of course do yes sir so the uh, good thing about this is uh, that it is a very flimsy mostly vascular and less fibrotic as compared to the srnvms have in macular all even uh, rcas and rap lesion they, they tend to fibros but this is just a membrane just there lying there and it is more vascular uh, unfortunately i don't have a follow up but one consequence of having this can be a bleed considering it's a vitreoretinal vitro uh, interface abnormality even a pvd can cause a bleed or is it because of the flimsy network itself bleeding because it's no vascular something that we have to see other allied questions is uh, is this uh, does it have a predilection for any one quadrant a and if so uh, are there more superficial capillary dropouts long side yes, that sir. area yes sir so uh, one thing it is difficult to say whether there is dropout because this membrane obscures the superficial capillaries in that slab and it has a projection artifact to the deeper slab also difficult to say about dropouts uh the predilection is obviously uh, at least in the limited cases that i have seen seven nice all of them are temporal paraphobic in what you said that they don't respond very well to anti vegfs no. like the other ones oh, no i don't have no this is this is pvac i was talking about pvac no, no, not the a... earlier one you differentiated the one which uh, like the one which i don't know the response to anti vegf um, i have i haven't injected anti vegf because if it's flimsy i i mean that could be one of the things that we could think of because yeah I, we have seen a couple of patients but i think most one was associated with diabetes and the other with hcr view so there of course you had this, so you felt that there was a reason why this mm. but uh, yeah these these patients if we inject what would be that is a uh, fnv coval so neovascular yeah okay frankly apurva uh, this article only i started looking at this uh, pft and and i have also found few cases uh, but uh, i was really wondering do you have follow up this, of the, of the seven patients that you have seen and whether any of them did have associated uh, cnvm with them or srnvm so uh, one thing is uh, i don't have a follow up uh, and all of them seem to have the pigment coming up to the superficial retina uh the retina was very thin and after that i think may I, they didn't follow up frankly but uh, maybe they would have developed neovascular i have really no answer to this question the only case that i have seen has had a follow up is not mine I have detected for a bled erin that also post anti vegf there is no i pro, i would think a pvd could make some difference Thank you, Dr. Abhul. Sir, your final thoughts before? Not sure if Ketan is here. We had we had actually done a study. If uh, Ketan, if you can come to your mic and the results of the observations you've made in uh, uh, vascular networks observed in patients with paraphobic telangiectasia, in terms of what were your observations in which had uh, pain in visual outcomes?
Ketan, can you come up in rest of time? My audio, yeah. Primary concern top EFT page where that some tend to respond and some do not. And there was no probable reason as to why. So we found out which kind of nets do tend to respond to anti of therapy in the form of vision improvement. These are some of the features that we noticed in the nets. There's bunching up of vessels. If there's any vessels in the outer retina on octa. If there's bunching up of vessels or looping up of vessels. Vessels which appear to be discontinuous to the periphery, peripheral vessels. The other uh, vascular networks that generally respond well in terms of vision recovery post anti -vage. Following that, uh, this is what, what we published also that these are the probable patients that you should treat when in the absence of fluid because they tend to show vision improvement post injury. Those three points which uh, are important in terms of that's what our observation has been. But I really like uh, to understand this progressive growth of uh, not growth actually the migration yeah. of the retinal pigment epithelium from the middle layers going all the way up to the retina is something one has to keep looking at uh, where you can see more of this new vascularization happening on the surface of the pigment. Thank you sir. Thank you Dr. Apurva. We'll move on to the next keynote talk. Are pachychoroid diseases really a spectrum? Dr. Srinivasan. Thanks very much. It looks like uh, they're still trying to download the presentation. It was a big file so they're still trying to move it I guess speaker room to hear, so we have a few seconds, but I'll, I'll just uh, thank the uh, organizers for this interesting and challenging topic to talk about, uh, make a case for why uh, these uh, conditions are a spectrum. But I will also highlight that, uh, that may, they may be a spectrum, but they're probably not pachychoroid, probably not the right name to get into that. So it looks like it's downloaded, so hopefully it's I come over to that side? Sorry for that. We'll uh, probably have the next speaker till the uh, presentation loads. Mahesh, sir. The serous and drusenoid PED treatment options, sub threshold laser or anti major. Dr. Mahesh ji. Thank you, VRSI. I think everyone is sleeping after a heavy lunch. So, how many of you do treat isolated serous and drusenoid PED? I think none, neither me. So, I think better you listen to this talk and then find the ways to expand your practice. But it is an interesting talk. Uh, it was originally thought that uh, the serous PED was due to uh, uh, the passage of fluid from chorea capillaries and through the Brex membrane, but this was not supported. Later they found that it is due to the decrease in hydraulic conductivity of Brex membrane. Uh, all this Brex membrane gets thickened due to deposition of materials and so that the fluid 
a passage to the Korea capillaries is affected. So that is the cause for this serous PED and uh, uh, resulting in physical separation. Now, drusenoid PED is basically due to coalescing of uh, multiple drusen, soft drusen and uh, due to deposition of these things and uh, the by definition uh, 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 soft drus is more than 125 microns and drusenoid PED is more than 350 microns size as per the arid study. Now, why it is important to consider treatment for this condition? Uh, serous PED in AMD usually uh, one third will develop CNVM, one third will develop uh, eventually geographic atrophy and the rest will remain more or less similar for uh, the duration, I mean five years. So, uh, it is uh, better that if there is some treatment that can prevent these catastrophic events. Like that, Drusenoid PED in ARET study, they showed that uh, most of the people developed uh, advanced AMD within five years and uh, so the basically it is due to the long term separation of the RP from underlying Brux membrane leading to RP atrophy and photoreceptor loss. So uh, early intervention to reattach the RP and Brux membrane might preserve this complication, I mean, prevent this complication. Now the difference of all these both PEDs everyone knows and uh, I initially took few articles uh, and uh, one of the Cochrane database uh, uh, review uh, considering of 11 studies showed that uh, laser as such uh, will not uh, uh, prevent uh, regression of Drusen, Drusenoid PED in a lot of uh, studies. Uh, but they suggested that uh, uh, the, the, the micropulse and subthreshold may offer some uh, effect in the future. Uh, they did not find any uh, significance in the prevention of geographic atrophy, but there was some evidence in uh, preventing development of CNV in these laser studies in Cochrane analysis. Now, there was another study, uh, laser and anti of injection uh, in Drusenoid PED. This was a 12 month study where uh, intermediate AMD cases, uh, they have given Pascal laser and it is not continue, it is not sub, uh, micropulse, it is a continuous wave sub threshold laser around the Drusenoid PED and to prevent CNVM development, they gave injection also and uh, they found that some of them did well. Uh, the top one, the left side is tre before treatment and towards the 12 month, the, Drus uh, the Drusenoid PED flattened while the other eye was used as a control and that did not happen, anything, uh, d uh, nothing happened in that eye. So, they said, uh, okay, some of the Drusenoid PED collapsed with uh, uh, this uh, sub threshold Pascal laser along with uh, anti of injection. So, this is another case uh, where uh, the, the each uh, the other cases were after treatment that the PED has collapsed, one, two, three, four cases, all of them did well. So, this is uh, regarding this study. So, in conclusion, uh, they mentioned that this could be a possibility of uh, 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 method of treatment in these cases. Now, there was another study, long term outcome of Drusenoid PED treatment with subthreshold micropulse treatment. This was another uh, uh, study where there were, there were 12 cases, uh, uh, 21 ISO 16 patients uh, were enrolled in this study and uh, they have treated with uh, uh, yellow wavelength uh, subthreshold micropulse laser uh, as a grid uh, and uh, uh, the data was not very impressive in the sense uh, 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 some of the PEDs collapsed, some did not collapse. So, they have given some pictures like uh, uh, you can see the left side one is one which is collapsed group that is after treatment the PED collapsed. So, in the left side initially there was increase in the size then it reduced. The right side the two pictures it is not collapsed group and uh, 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 so, they found that it in many cases so, the, what they uh, postulated is this micropulse subthreshold laser enhances the uh, natural course or natural course of the PED uh, life and uh, uh, that may result in some improvement in future. So, that is one small conclusion from that. So, uh, this is uh, another study that I got. Now, I have, I went through whole uh, uh, files and then I found two, three cases. This was a, uh, uh, right eye of one patient uh, with uh, large serous PED. In fact, uh, vision was 6 by 24. He had undergone uh, multiple injections of avastin from elsewhere. And uh, fluorescent angiogram ICG showed there was a small notch 
with a polyp in ICG. So, this one what I did was I gave micropulse uh, subthreshold and uh, next day I injected uh, uh, anti-VEGF also and uh, this was the OCT and uh, uh, angiogram correlation and uh, this was uh, treatment pre-treatment and post-treatment within one month the whole thing went off I was shocked actually I again checked whether that is the same eye of the patient so this was pre-treatment and the right side there was complete collapse of the zero speed as well as the uh, notch also and one one and a half months later it was doing well and three months later again that PED has started coming up so this is nothing great but that is one then this was another case of serous PED in a uh, central serous retinopathy case uh, so the doctor and patient had a waxing and waning of fluid uh, this I did actually uh, reduce flow and speedity some time back and uh, following treatment last six years patient is doing well with flat uh, uh, so these are some of the other treatment options that we have anyway it is open for discussion thank you thank you sir so you have spoken for the laser we have an app question here yellow laser is it promising or just a jazzy treatment which one, sir? yellow laser is it a promising treatment or just a jazzy treatment uh, Micropulse, micropulse. Micro yeah, actually, since we are doing that because there is no other options nowadays available after the PDT become, Dysodine has become unavailable. But the, uh, I think one thing that we should do is we should retreat with the micropulse. That is what the, we are not doing. We will give one time micropulse anyway, it is sub threshold. So after that, we will not repeat it frequently. Probably in these two studies, they have repeated the micropulse after three months again. So if we repeat uh, micropulse, I think it will work. That is uh, what I have understood. Anand. Yeah, uh, actually, it's a good thing you brought up this point. Uh, there's a sub threshold of uh, ophthalmic uh, micropulse laser society. Fortunately, it'll be part of that. And we just put out some guidelines in a tutorial in IAN, which we'll be watching sooner. Uh, yeah, like you said, uh, the one advantage of this is you can repaint Ovia repeatedly. Works very well for CSCR. Uh, I think we're still uh, finding our ground with diabetic macroedema. Uh, so, uh, the parameters have to be established. I think one uh, criticism of this uh, form of therapy is that uh, the parameters are not definitively defined. And on the label from the EU, they use very standardized 100 milliwatts and stick with that. But we believe in titrating and uh, then using threshold and works very well. And uh, he's actually shown us, I don't think there's that more uh, going off. This has been seen quite often. But then again, and nowadays I am retreating some of the cases yeah, where uh, even in chronic yes. CSCR, I am retreating. So I am getting after second sitting, pro they are improving I mean, anatomically, they are improving well. Vignesh, add on to that, um, uh, serious PEDs would like to know the opinion. Uh, I have a cohort of patients without fluid but pachycoroid, and I have used epilerinone with uh, variable results. They've imp some have improved, some have not improved. Have any experience? Apply or not? Yeah. I don't usually give that much. Uh, okay. I mean, can I add, madam? Please. Yes, sir, Please. Dr. Vignesh from Arvind Hospital, Madurai. So I just want to share some experience on treatment of serious PED. I have, I have been using. I have just seen like uh, improvement in uh, this uh, decrease in apply or in case of CSCR with uh, uh, in case of PED decrease in PED in case of CSCR with apply or not. So then I treated uh, only like only serious PED without fluid. And I got around uh, eight cases I, I have right now, around 50%, four cases improved completely uh, with epilirinone. That, that is one, one thing I want to add. And another thing regarding the micropulse laser, even in uh, extrafovial small fibrovascular PED, I have done micropulse laser because the patient was not willing for anti-VEGF and the vision, vision was good. I have a follow-up of nearly two years and uh, with multiple, as you said, sir, like uh, multiple times multiple I did. Things. Whenever there was small, some uh, small fluid, subdental fluid, I added, did the laser. So I have kept the CNVM under control with micropulse laser. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. In the interest of time, and we have an overlapping talk also. Uh, sorry for the little glitch we had. We'd like to call uh, Dr. Srinivas Sada for his keynote talk, Our Pachycoroid Diseases, Really a Spectrum. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to try again, hopefully this time successfully. Okay. So uh, these are my disclosures again. Uh, and so I first want to acknowledge my good friend, uh, Bailey uh, Freund. Uh, we've collaborated a lot on this topic. I'm going to share some of 
data from a recently published uh, study as well, and Bailey shared with me uh, slides that I'm also going to share. So first I thought, you know, I, I was very challenged by this question that the organizers gave me to tackle. Uh, and so the first thing I guess I should highlight is why is this question even being raised? And uh, you know, Rick Spade had highlighted in this nice editorial uh, when he surveyed the literature to see the definitions of pachycoid, he found that they were being used inconsistently because many people were applying it based on different cut points or critical thickness. Uh, and so not all of the relevant features that we might think of uh, being associated with this disease were present in all cases. Uh, and in fact, actually, this name is probably the wrong name. And maybe at the end of the discussion, we can talk about what should be the proper name. Uh, and that's because the choroid can be thick, thin, or normal in these uh, patients. So again, we probably need to have a reclassification. But let's set that aside and say, well, why should we think of these conditions as being part of a spectrum? And it's really, this is a nice review article from Jemmy and um, Bailey, where they highlighted that these conditions that we're talking about all exist, uh, exhibit a characteristic set of choroidal alterations that are believed to represent different manifestations of a common pathophysiologic process. So what are these conditions? What is that common pathophysiology? What are the characteristic alterations and features? So this is an example of a typical kind of patient. Uh, this patient is asymptomatic, good vision. Everyone can appreciate the RP alterations in the, in the fovea in this case. The other eye has a few hard drusen, but really no soft drusen. So this is not a drusen-driven uh, condition. But certainly we can appreciate in the choroid, I'm highlighting a certain area there where you can see that there are large choroidal veins. There's a small area of RP elevation that everyone can appreciate here as well. Uh, here you see on the ICGA uh, this region where again you see that additional uh, hyperfluorescence, uh, also easy to spot on the ONFOS uh, swept source OCT as well. This of course uh, corresponds to an area overlying those large dilated choroidal vessels where there is actually a type 1 neovascular membrane, and so we call this pachycoid neovasculopathy, and I'll, I'll get into that in a bit more detail in a, in a moment, just to highlight that we found OCTA to be especially useful for highlighting uh, these types of uh, lesions. Now, I want to call your attention, I, I was almost afraid to show this slide because it feels somewhat self-serving, because uh, this comes from the uh, seventh edition of Brian's Retina, which obviously I edit, uh, and uh, and so, but I think this nice chapter from Jemmy um, and um, uh, and, and Bailey is, is really quite nice uh, because it highlights the different mechanisms of these different diseases, Drusen-driven dis uh, disease versus pachycoroid diseases, and both their non-neovascular pigmentary alteration phases as well as their neovascular phases. So I, I think it's a really nice description of this, of this disorder, of these, these set of diseases. And in fact, uh, you know, just like uh, with a typical AMD, uh, these pachycoid diseases can be divided into this non-nevascular phase, having a pigment epithelopathy or, or central serous retinopathy, or a kind of a variant of central serous in this peripapillary pachycoid syndrome, and of course can have a neovascular phase with neovascularization with or without the presence of additional aneurysmal dilations. So what is that? I highlighted earlier, I said that there's a key common underlying pathophysiology that would argue for making this a spectrum. What is it? Well, it's really all about chordal venous congestion. And this is actually not a new topic. You can see that there are articles getting back to 1986 highlighted this uh, concept. I, I do want to in particular acknowledge Shoji Kishi in Japan, because he, he really highlighted, I think, a very important concept that when you have chordal venous congestion, it does lead to secondary alterations and remodeling of the choroid. And he showed that obviously in a different model, uh, in, the, in a scleral buckling uh, sort of model where that causes some compression. Uh, but nonetheless, the critical aspect here is the secondary alterations that occur in the choroid, which are very important. And of course, that seems to be very important in this uh, set of pachychoroid, again, not the right name, uh, diseases. Uh, where again, venous congestion, uh, you know, even this article from several years ago, they highlighted how uh, congested vortex vein ampullas appear to be important. So again, this is really probably the, one of the most important slides, really is to highlight, you know, what is this disease? What are the critical features? This is a disease, choroidal venous congestion. So you have dilated choroidal veins uh, draining to dilated vortex ampulla. Okay? Uh, and uh, in ICGA, you see choroidal vascular hyperpermeability around the pachy vessels. Of course, uh, you can then have um, a choroidal thickening in these areas of venous congestion and vascular remodeling. Uh, and that choroidal um, um, vascular remodeling, which is associated with loss of the choriocapillaris and ischemia, leads to the secondary RP alterations, the pachydrusen, macular neovascularization, and ultimately the aneurysm formation. 
So we've been very interested in studying uh, these venous drainage uh, patterns. This is a recent paper that we published in collaboration with Bailey's group. Uh, just to compare um, uh, pa pa pachychoria disease eyes to a normal eye, and we had collected a normative database of patients using ultra-wide field ICG, and I think it's very apparent. You don't have to be an expert to appreciate the dilated vortex vein ampulla in this condition. But the interesting thing that we observed and that led to this study is that there seems to be a great asymmetry in terms of how much of a particular quadrant actually serves or drains a particular zone of retina. If you compare that to normals, normals, it's, you know, each of the quadrants kind of has a pretty even amount of retinal territory or uh, uh, um, so that it serves, but it seems to be quite asymmetric in these, in these patients who have pachychoria disease. This is a study that we conducted. This is just some of the demographic characteristics. Just to highlight, we looked at a variety of different stages of this, of this uh, spectrum, this is the, uh, the publication uh, on normals from before, but again to highlight that you see this significant variation from quadrant to quadrant in the, in the pachychoroid patients where it's really quite symmetric uh, in, uh, and similar amongst the quadrants and patients that are, that are otherwise normal. Uh, and, uh, and so the other thing to highlight uh, is that, uh, that at, the, at the terminal ends of these areas of these dilated uh, cortical veins is where we see the cortical vascular hyperfluorescence uh, that correlates very well with these uh, terminal tips. And of course, that's also where we see the greatest cortical thickness. That's why the cori doesn't necessarily have to be thick uh, in, the, in these patients because it really is only in that zone. And you can obviously start out with a thin choroid. Uh, which can mask this, uh, this appearance. Now, you may have also heard Rick Spade has talked extensively about these intervortex vein uh, collaterals. Uh, they didn't really seem to correlate necessarily uh, with the size of the drainage area. We actually think the size of the drainage area, that asymmetry, is a much more important finding, which really highlights the fact that there is this cortical venous drainage abnormality and this remodeling that's, uh, that's uh, occurring in these individuals. And again, the cortical thickness seems to correspond areas of cortical uh, vascular um, hyperpermeability. So um, ultra-wide fill ICGA, uh, this has really highlighted that cortical venous insufficiency is a key, key critical aspect of the disease. It relates to this imbalance in cortical venous drainage. And congestion of one or more vortex vein systems it was associated with this uh, process and this regional cortical thickening and subsequent um, um, remodeling. So I just want to finish by highlighting again some of the conditions in the spectrum. Of course, you can have this pachychoric pigment of theopathy. This is the first sign. And again, you already have choriocapillaris alterations when this is uh, manifest, uh, but you see loss of the inner choroid over the pachy vessels and the pigment alterations then appear. Uh, these patients uh, can develop significant choroidal hyperpermeability. And it's not surprising, right, when we see diabetic macular ischemia uh, in areas of non-perfusion, we see leakage. And so it's not surprising in areas of choriocapillaris ischemia, you see the same uh, thing. Same thing. Uh, and it's just to highlight again that same type of a case. And of course, these patients in response to the choriocapillaris ischemia can progress to developing neovascularization, uh, which uh, can um, progress in some cases, especially when you have this abnormal uh, hyperdynamic venous system. It's not surprising you can get aneurysmal uh, dilations in some cases. And again, this is a nice case. I think it highlights the vascularity. You see the choriocapillaris ischemia here and the neovascularization developing that area. Lastly, and I know I'm a bit over time, I'll finish with this uh, concept uh, that, uh, that, you know, this aneurysmal type 1 neovascularization that we've called it. Again, the APOIS group, we decided that everyone likes the term polypoidal, so we said that's fine, you can keep that. Uh, but we think these are aneurysmal type of lesions uh, that occur. Just to highlight that it's, you know, it doesn't have to happen only in the setting of pachychoric disease. It can happen in neovascular AMD and a variety of other conditions as well. And that's what's highlighted in the, in the new Ryan text. That, uh, that you know you can get um, uh, this type of aneurysmal nevascularization both in the setting of pachychoric disease as well as in the setting of drusen uh, d d drusen driven disease. I will also highlight that you know Phil Rosenfeld's group recently questioned whether these are actually aneurysms. Sometimes you can have this tangled vessels, but I would argue that these tangled vessels are actually sort of fusiform aneurysms as opposed to saccular aneurysms. So I think still aneurysmal is a reasonable term to describe these uh, patients and just to show another such case, which I will just skip past in the interest of. So, uh, so to summarize, uh, pachychoria disease is characterized by exudative and or degenerative ch changes overlying areas of choroidal venous insufficiency. These degenerative and exudative changes are what constitute the spectrum of findings. I talked about how multimodal imaging shows these dilated choroidal veins, the attenuated inner choroid, the choroidal vascular hyperpermeability, which really reflects this remodeling that's occurring. 
So keep in mind that pachychoroid's the wrong term, really. Uh, can you have thick, thin, or normal choroids? Uh, and these polyportal lesions are really aneurysmal structures that arise in the late stage of this type 1 event. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sada. Extensive and elaborate indeed. But, uh, I'd like to come back to that point that you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. We were very particular, and I believe it was intentional that, you know, wanted to mention that pachychoroid is not really pachychoroid. You wanted to discuss another possible terminology. You can just elaborate on that. Yeah, you know, we've been debating, uh, you know, the, the reason we haven't already proposed an, an absolute new name is that um, we're still struggling to find the best descriptor, right? So some people have come, suggested venous overload choroidopathy, venous congestion, uh, critical venous congestion choroidopathy, or venous congestion choroidopathy. Uh, and so um, it's something of that ilk, be probably the name uh, to best describe these uh, conditions. But yeah, I'm, I'm, if, the, if someone in the audience has a great name to suggest, I think we understand what we're talking about. And now you know it when you see it, because you see these key features. We know that there is a congestion issue. It's actually led to some interesting discussions. People obviously have used scleral windows to treat uvula effusion syndrome. So some people have asked, do you do scleral windows to treat this? And I guess no one's been bold enough to treat patients with these problems using that approach. And we don't know exactly the mechanism of the venous congestion here. Uh, um, uh, you know, one could argue based on Shoji Kishi's work with the scleral buckle that maybe it is that. It, it is some tightening there. But maybe somebody bold here will do that in a, in a, in a IRB approved study uh, to, uh, to study that as a treatment with intractable uh, case. But again, with the good vision that these patients have, most of us probably aren't going to be doing scleral windows on a central serous patient. Now, coming to the what would the possible mechanism of the uh, this overload, whether it's a combination of hypermetropia and that uh, triggers it, and why certain, like if it was because of, uh, you know, the way our ampullas are, then we run in families, we get genetic predilection. Yeah, those, those are all good questions. Uh, it doesn't, I guess I suppose it doesn't have to be genetic, it could be some developmental um, thing that's not genetic as well. Uh, but, uh, but we don't know. Um, um, uh, we, we just know that we, we're seeing these sort of the common final pathway, the end stage, um, and what are the different mechanisms that can lead to chordal venous congestion. I think we're at the early days of that part. I think we finally recognize this is the downstream pathophysiologic mechanism. What's the upstream aspect? Why do you get venous congestion? Uh, you know, what are all of the risk factors for that? All of the you know, young people in this audience can figure that out because we haven't yet. So, uh, uh, Srinivas, again, excellent talk. I just want to ask you, are there any efforts on to quantify, you know, uh, choriocapillaris ischemia as, you know, triggering the remodeling on movement or a sliding across the pachycoroid spectrum? Suppose a patient presents with, uh, you know, pachycoroid pigment epitheliopathy. Anything to suggest when they would go in for CSCR yeah, or so, so PCN? Great, you know, some great. can go directly for PCV, some can go through the spectrum and reach PCN later. Thing to suggest. Yeah, yeah, Alan, thanks for, I appreciate you foreshadowing some of the things I'm going to say in my, in my duration tomorrow as I'm going to talk about this uh, a bit. But I can say it now. Uh, basically, yeah, we do think that we know that patients who have some features of this spectrum, you know, thick and chord, maybe with some dilated vessels, there is a stage where there is no, not any significant choriocapillaris injury. Rick Spade has published on that. And you don't see any pigment alterations. So we do believe now that the, finally the injury to the chorea capillaris is the tipping point at which you start to have these secondary you know, degenerative and then exudative uh, consequences of that chorea capillaris injury. So how much chorea capillaris injury do you have to have before you get there? That we haven't figured out yet. Yes, sir, Vignesh. So like the PCV, like we can, can we say like we have two types of PCV, like PCV associated with pachychoroid, PCV associated with wet ARMD, both behaving in a different way. Like because as you said, like the polyps we are seeing in this pachychoroid associated, we, it is like kind of a, kind of a group of network of vessels rather than a polyp. So are, are the polyps seen in wet AMD are different from the polyps seen in the pachychoroid spectrum? Um, so we don't know the answer to that. Also, like uh, some of you may have, um, been, who are at AP Veris may have seen, Jemmy Chung gave a nice talk where she classified that in their analysis using multimodal imaging, some of these polypoidal lesions looked like the glomeruli that Rosenfeld and colleagues had described. Others looked like the typical sort of pulsatile uh, kind of lesions where you can see on ICGA, you can see the pulsatility. It clearly is a saccular aneurysm. 
that case. Uh, and I think that may be two different entities. And one of the, the questions I asked Jemmy was, which one seems to have the risk? The risk seems to all be associated with the pulsatile ones in terms of the risk for hemorrhage, non-responsiveness to anti-VEGF therapy, whereas the other doesn't. So I would question whether that lamerulus should even be called polypoidal. That would be what I would say. So I would say the only, the real thing, because really, why do we even bother calling it that? Because we think that infers a different treatment response, a different prognosis outcome for the patient. So, and the differences between drusen-driven versus pachycori, that's still, that's, that's where the field is at, still to be worked out. PCV in ink and PCV in world, so can we, can we classify something like that, like PCV in ink behaving differently? PCV well, in the I, I think there's gonna be drusen-driven driven and versus pachycori driven or whatever we're gonna call this, yeah. Thank you, thank you. We have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, I think we'll move ahead. So there were a lot of uh, take home points uh, from that interesting talk by Dr. Sada. The nomenclature is open to change and uh, it's basically a congestive and a degenerative process. Without further ado, Dr. Anand Rajendran, VMT, watch was operate. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam and the VRSI Scientific Committee for having me here. So uh, I'm going to be talking on uh, vitreo macular attraction. So it's very much uh, like the Shakespearean dilemma the iconic poser which uh, Shakespeare and Hamlet put out, to be or not to be, the VRSI in 2022 centuries later is asking us whether to operate or not to operate uh, vitreo macular attraction. And we'll go through a bunch of, you know, uh, scenarios and figure that out. So the definition, it's a disorder of the vitreo retinal interface with an incomplete posterior vitreous detachment, abnormally strong adherence of this posterior halloid to the macula. And this anteroposterior attraction is exerted by the synergetic vitreous at adherent sites leading on to uh, obvious morphological and functional macula. So it's a good to define the disease and separate it from VMA or vitreo macular addition, which is basically a partial uh, vitreous detachment, primarily persistent vitreous attachment within a three millimeter radius from the center of the fovea. There is an acute angle between the posterior hyaloid and in the retinal phase, but importantly, there is absence of changes in the foveal contour of retinal or RP morphology. With vitreo macular attraction, the first three are the same, just that you would have presence of changes in the foveal contour or the retina RP uh, morphology without a full thickness. And you could have additional features of foveal pseudosis, macular thickening, sky edema, or detachments, obviously be reduced to distorted vision in any of the three stages of the macular hole. So both of them have been uh, described, uh, classified based on OCT. Focal, when the width of attachment is less than equal to 1500 microns, broad, uh, VMT when the width of attachment more than 1500 microns and it's concurrent when it's associated with other macular abnormalities, isolated or not. So here are a few predictors of VMT release uh, uh, OCD biomarkers uh, by Almeda and group. So patients with only inner retinal distortion are more likely to have spontaneous release of VMT 10.45 times in the study. And you often get this column sign which is a tractional skytic elevation of the inner retina and uh, patients with BMT involving both inner and outer retinal layers, it's unlikely to have spontaneous VMT release. Whereas they've also noted the patients receiving anti-VEGF injections for any etiology, 7.3 times uh, higher risk chance of a spontaneous release. And patients, when they have both anti-VEGF use as well as isolated inner retinal involvement, bumped up to 16.28 times chance of spontaneous release. Uh, Garcia Leana in a, a review, uh, suggested that VMA, uh, one needs to observe only, that's right, vitreomacular attraction when asymptomatic, a three month close follow up, interested and is ideal. VMT when it's less than 1500 microns and in the absence of macular epiretinal membranes, you can observe. Some people were doing octoplasmin, now it's you know, fallen out of favor. When they were doing it, they were looking at it at day seven and day 30 and if it progressed beyond, then they would do it track me, not in more. VMT more than, 1500 microns with or without an ERM, past planar vitrectomy under the eye base. Types and manifestations of VMT, you can have a B-type VMT, you can have this J-shaped VMT with B-shaped VMT, there's usually lower pre-op equity, better post-op uh, equity uh, improvement because of that, because of the fractional SEME and macular hole associated with J-shaped, you have greater pre-op equity, lesser post-op equity improvement, like the effect, and other chronic changes of ERM, RPDs, uh, focal VMTs do obviously better than uh, broad VMTs with traction skysis, which have a pro prognosis. And likewise, microfoveal traction with four field ERDs uh, better than broad VMTs. 
Here it is. These are a few surgical indications uh, intramacular attractions with outer lamellar holes, thickness macular holes, with epiretinal membranes, with fractional ME, where you would comfortably think of uh, surgery. On the other hand, contraindications would be a fibrotic scar, atrophic scar, you know, MACTEL, proliferation or myopia here with uh, 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 outer retinal degeneration, serious PDs or regressing CNVMs, probably you'll see. And this is a case that uh, I came across a little while back, uh, which shows the importance looking at the fellow eye. So this, the left eye came in with a chronic macular hole, the right eye with uh, incipient vitro macular attraction with good vision. And in September 2019, three months later, we, I mean, when we operated the left eye, we saw that that with invasive peeling, the restoration of anatomy, but the right eye developed a stage three macular hole. So it shows you the importance that one eye develops a hole, the other eye can also go in that direction and move very rapidly. And then we operated, uh, uh, there was COVID, I think, peak period then. Then uh, the patient, uh, three months later, decided to go into surgery. Then you can see the left eye improving, and then, of course, improvement. So just to focus and bring your attention to the importance of looking at the progress in the other eye. So guiding factors, good prognosticators from an equity point of visual equity, moderate visual equity 660 with a regional drop in vision, uh, opposite for poor prognosticators, clinical uh, factors, healthy outer retinal layers, owner, owner retina up to the optic uh, uh, outer nuclear layer, lower baseline macular thickness, V-shaped VMT, and anti vegf treatment use. And also look at the fellow eye, one-eyed or equity, uh, uh, I mean, if you drop with vitro macular fraction, then perhaps you should surgery in the study eye. Management macros is observe if there's VMA or VMT, which is asymptomatic, close three-month follow-up, good equity, VMT, uh, less than equal to 1,500 microns. We ask the patient to uh, self-monitor with AMSLAS, monocular tests. Symptomatic VMT, equity reducing, less than 612, more than uh, 1,500 microns of VMT and associated pathologies, but perhaps go in for surgery. When you go in for surgery, also you can, there are decisions to be in. Do we do it early in our time SOS or do we avoid it? So early vitrectomy, rapid steep drop in equity or fraction, do it early. Uh, in time with moderate drop or if there's mild increase in VMT and avoid it of course if there are prognosticators. This was another uh, overall review out by Garcia Leana where they've also uh, looked at uh, you know, ocriplasmin. We can talk about this. Don, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, just to begin the discussion, what is the role of ILM peeling when you do uh, vitreo macular traction release as such? Is there any area that you'd like to cover? Or So, like I said, only if it's associated with, let's say, an epiretinal membrane, and that also fairly dense. So the reasons for doing it would be more for the epiretinal membrane and the concurrent pathology rather than the VMT per se. And uh, you would do it because you prevent, you know, a sac scaffold for the reproliferation of the epiretinal membrane. That would be a primary. Also, once you, I showed you the uh, broad-shaped traction of the J-shaped VMT. That in invariably has an epiretinal membrane. Could you be more appropriate. Doing it there, but otherwise not necessary. Do you also have any specific technique? In this case is very very careful not to island over, uh, over the phone. Yeah, if it is a pure VMT, like I said, without uh, um, let's say lamellar defects, then I would uh, you know just regular way. But I'd also be careful you know, when I'm going in, I'd like to see how apparent it is. And I would also like to add this is a good thing for putting this. This is a case where you might want to put in, especially if the patient is diabetic. I'm uh, staining. Might even you know, look like Of course, that would possibly where it's possibly not is when you have a cataract and you haven't got Yeah, and uh, excellent talk. And I just wanted to add a point. This uh, thing was about ERM, right? Epiretinal membrane. VMT base. So, uh, yeah, so uh, because uh, when a VMT is associated with ERM, actually, especially in a, uh, the age as a criterion, you did not discuss probably. When it occurs in a very young patient, for example, we have to look at other causes. Uh, one of them, uh, like uh, with vitro retinal, uh, retinal vitro traction, can be mild hematoma or this. Secondary year is probably you have to look. So your choice of tamponade agents or if any, what would you be looking at? How would you close the case? Yeah, if it's like if you talk about this, you know, straight and narrow, if it's only VMT, then you obviously don't need any uh, tamponade at all. 
but if uh, associated with macular hole by going strictly by the definition of EMT, you shouldn't have a macular hole. But if you do have an associated macular hole, then that takes over uh, the well, The ERM or down. the macular uh, contour, change in contour of the macular folds uh, dictate to what uh, tamponade you would. Uh, yeah, use. you could go in with a subsequent gas or it depends on how chronic it is. Like you saw in that first patient on the left side, I went in with C3F8 because I also my choice of uh, peeling also changes. Those kind of cases, I always go in with the asylum peel. One of the things is sometimes when we are removing the vitro macular traction, I think it's always a good idea to go back and stain again because very often actually part of the ILM has come out. So a complete ILM around that area could be, but I think it's always not a bad idea to. When our uh, proficiency and when ILM team with their hand there. But just to add to that, um, also in ILM peel, uh, uh, rather not peel over the fovea and leave a rim. And uh, sometimes if it's an acute angled vitromacular traction, then it's better to do the vitrectomy, a little bit of vitrectomy there and clear the uh, VMP tracks and then go and create the PVD because sometimes when we create the PVD, it can de-roof the uh, very thin inner foveal layer. I think that's a point well taken. If it's, uh, if it's, if it's chitic, and that I showed in one of my pictures, a lot of defect and you have only a foveal uh, ILM drape there and uh, a foveal sparing ILM peeling. Order. Yes, I think. That no, I just want to reiterate a few points in your help in prognosticate. Because it's all vitromacular surface problems, managing expectations of the patients is extremely important because the central vision got affected. Now, uh, highlight those changes which would help in better prognostication is something which should be take away for anyone before advising the surgery because it's not about the skill, it's more about understanding which ones are going to give better visual outcome. It's not very challenging in terms of the skill. Uh, outer retinal involvement, hectic change. Large intraretinals, presence of comorbidities uh, highlighted as something which has to be understood for operating. And the way you operate in terms of uh, the one major challenge which you have highlighted in one of those uh, pages, you the thick bridge, posterior hyaloid, which exists between two areas of contact, that can pose of a challenge where when you're trying to peek, uh, there's going to be. Exactly uh, the question that somebody is raising here. Intraoperatively, what precautions would you take to avoid de-roofing and causing a partial or full thickness hole? And uh, that was uh, addressed by Vasumadi Madam when she said that we kind of uh, identify the plane before inducing a PVD. I have another question. When would we operate on a patient of dry AMD with concurrent VMD? Dry yes. AMD with concurrent VMD. We do see this often in our clinical practice. Yes, so I think the most important thing is A, uh, presenting visual equity. B, whether there's metamorphopsia. I think the most important thing is the changing visual equity, which I showed in my matrix, rapid drop. So even where you do the thing, how early you would do it, whether you would do it SOS or biding your time, depends on the patient. Finally, again, going back to what I think I should say, not treating that OCD, we're treating the patient. The patient's metamorphopsia is increasing, and you do not think it's because of a new, uh, dry AMD converting to new vascular AMD, because that also would be then perhaps you can go in with uh, surgical removal. Because with surgery, you're only treating a mechanical uh, cause for loss in vision, not treating creative cause. And okay. there's no harm if there is fluid coming in and on an octa, you find a network, consider giving antivision. Thank you, thank you, sir. So as Apli said, uh, planning is everything, surgery is almost nothing. So we have uh, our take-home points there. That brings us uh, to the end of our uh, talks. We'll move on to the free papers. I'd call Dr. Salin Shah. Dr. Salin Shah will be speaking about correlating patterns of DME. Don't think uh, presenter is available. So I'll move on to the next one. Dr. Kiran Chandran, are you there? Characterizing right angled vessel in type 2 mactal on SD OCT and OCT. Dr. Kiran Chandran.
Welcome everyone. Today I'll be talking on uh, characterizing right angle vessels on speckle domain OCT and octa and MACTIL. So, uh, Glassenblory, uh, as per Glassenblory classifications, the appearance of right angle vessels basically defines the start of stage 3 MACTIL, which is a bilateral, slowly progressive macular disease with neurodegenerative and vascular alterations. So, the aim of our study was to determine changes associated with RAV on SD, OCT, and OCTA as well as to determine RAV associated morphological changes during the course of disease progression. So it was a single center observation study which recruited 56 eyes of 49 patients across stages 3, 4 and 5. The exclusion criteria were eyes with advanced disease and those with poor imaging quality. So this is a uh, representation of a patient in which uh, the uh, right angle vessels were properly demonstrated using the whole retina octa slab. Uh, and uh, in which the color fundus photo was not able to show an RAV very clearly. So with a high degree of uh, sensitivity, octa, the whole retinal octa can pick up an RAV. So uh, we divided the RAVs using an ETDRS grid into eight quadrants and uh, the naming of these uh, RAVs was done based on these quadrant wise classification. For example, the superior temporal RAV was named based on the course from the superior quadrant and ending in the temporal quadrant. So these were the STOCT characteristics we analyzed in association RAV, mainly the outer retinal defects in the form of IDZ and EZ loss as well as ELM loss. Uh, the collapse of the inner into the outer retina, the presence of cavitations, pigment migration and subretinal hyperreflectivity. On, on October, we analyzed the uh, presence of telangiectasias in the deep uh, superficial as well as deep capillary plexus. And on outer retina core capillary slab, the presence of nodular hyperreflectivity and network and the presence of retinal coronal anastomosis. So this is a representative example of RAV associated outer retinal layer changes. So there are two RAVs here as demonstrated by the green arrow. The one is in the temporal quadrant and other is in the superior quadrant. And uh, the corresponding OCT sections actually show the appearance of outer retinal defects exactly corresponding to the region where the RAV is about to terminate, the visible portion of the termination of RAV in both, the, uh, both these RAVs. So these were our results. Majority of eyes were recruited from stage three followed by stages four and five. Three eyes which initially belonged to stage two had an RAV on octa. So stage-wise uh, progression of RAV, there was increase in RAV with progression of macular disease and majority of RAVs were present in the inferior temporal followed by the superior temporal quadrants. So these were the STOCD findings in relation to the RAV. Uh, so the majority of eyes had an IDZ as well as EZ loss um, and these were basically present extrafoveally, extrafoveal cent uh, center. Uh, and uh, RAVs had a high degree of association with IDZ and EZ attenuation as well as loss, as well as the presence of RP migration and subretinal hyperreflectivity. On follow-up parameters, at each follow-up visit, there was an increase in IDZ, EZ as well as ELM loss corresponding to each RAV, maximum in the nasal quadrant RAV. So these were the octa findings. The linkages were present in all 56 eyes of patients with RAV. And, um, while in superficial vascular complex, there was only 11 eyes which had uh, um, telangiectasias. And the location of telangiectasias was maximum temporal quadrant. So coming to a few representative cases, this is a patient with stage 2 MACTIL in which uh, there are no SDOCD findings. It looks normal. While on whole retina octa, you can see an RAV over here. And corresponding DCP, deep capillary plexus, shows the presence of telangiectasia. Second example shows a patient with stage 3 MACTIL in which inferior temporal RAV can be seen uh, and at presentation an RAV can be well delineated on whole retina slab and corresponding telangiectasia can be seen temporal to the foveal vascular zone in the deep cap reflexes. And at presentation you can see an IDZ layer which is, um, which is showing slight at risk characteristics and subsequent follow up visits shows IDZ attenuation followed by IDZ loss over the course of two years. So this is a patient is stage 3 MACTIL, again uh, the uh, superior temporal RAV initially starts off at attenuation in the IDZ layer which progresses to involve the uh, yeah, ellipsoid zone and lately the, uh, uh, later the external limiting membrane which collapse. And whole retina octa shows uh, the morphological changes associated with this RAV in the form of slight straightening over the course of two years with apparent lengthening as well. And the telangiectasias cases on DCP which are more uh, organized initially are Bro uh, having a broken twig like pattern at two years follow up and you can see the appearance of a network now at subsequent follow up which is not present initially. This is exactly corresponding to the location of the 
Cupido temporal RAV. So this is a follow-up of a patient with initial stage four macular overcourse of five years, which shows uh, network appearing um, as we follow up the patient over five years with increase in the uh, loss of the outer retinal bands. And deep capillary plex, sorry, the deep capillary plexus also shows increased rarefaction as we follow up the patient with morphology changes in RAV, which shows more uh, skewing of vessels and more clustering of vessels around the temporal para paraphobial region. So the earliest changes associated with RAV occur in uh, the form of telangiectasias in the deep capillary plexus even before structural changes start, which begin extrafovially in the interdigitation zone before involving the EZ layer. RAV was associated with hyperreflectivity uh, on uh, OCD, which corresponded on octa to nodal hyperreflectivity or neovascularization. So association between RAV and neovascularization in macular has been uh, studied by Dr. Spade, who actually studied when the descent of RAV from the deep capillary plexus towards the retinal pigment the epithelium, the, the formation of retinal, retinal anastomosis as well as retinal coral anastomosis, as well as morphology changes associated with progression of macular have been studied in the form of straightening, apparent lengthening, and increased pigmentation. So there, therefore, the progression of RAV to the outer retina with associated morphological changes could signify uh, macular-related progression. So our observations corroborate the role of RAV as an important precursor to both structural and functional progression in macular. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Before we go into the discussion, I request the speakers and the panelists to stay back uh, until the end of the session for a photograph. Uh, I'd open the discussion with Dr. Uh, Dr. Rupak, uh, sir. Done uh, some work on this. Your thoughts, please. Uh, so, only one thing I'm really concerned about this study is, uh, see, in PFT, uh, MACTEL cases, there is a lot of pigmentation, retinal thing. Were you able to segment uh, all this? Uh, uh, your eyes, did you segment them manually to look for? Yeah, the we manually segmented each one using OCA slabs, like um, from a vascular complex as well as the outer retinal chorea capillary plexus. Sometimes in some of your cases, what I can feel is that uh, if there is outer retinal atrophy, sometimes the chorea capillary yeah. can be seen as a as yeah, a projection network, artifact, uh, which is sometimes we call as unmasking artifact, yeah. which can sometimes Correct. be confused as a CNP. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you careful to remove those? Yeah, yeah. You carefully analyze the preceding uh, slabs to see if those similar characteristics to um, exclude the projection artifacts. Uh, very nice. Uh, Kiran, in your uh, sub-series of uh, MACTEL with uh, SAR and VM, you notice a higher incidence of the RAVs. Yeah, the number of RAVs increase with progression of MACTEL from stages 3 to 5. Yeah. The RCA associated with yeah, whether you were seeing the flow pattern in that and what. The uh, retinochoral complex were actually seen even before the onset of neovascularization in MACTL, which I put in one of the cases in stage 3 MACTL, so uh, like retinochoral anastomosis being formed. But we don't have so many eyes, around three eyes or seven RVAs, that's all we have in our place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I believe that brings us to the end of this session on macular diseases. I think it was really useful for all of us. A lot of good discussion and take-home points. Thank uh, VRSI and the scientific committee for putting this together. Thank you again.